first time I'm going to start recording. Um, welcome everybody for our um, um, DMG seminar series uh, of our university. And uh, today uh, we are very honored to host uh, Dr. Anel Paldor from the University of Delaware in the United States. So thank you very much for coming, even that it's very early morning for you, Anel. Uh, some words about uh, Anel. Uh, he graduated from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in 2011, majored in geology, and then he received his PhD from the same university, Hebrew University, in hydrology and water resources program in 2019. Uh, then he started a postdoc position in 2018 at the University of Dal Delaware. And in 2022, he started an associated uh, scientist position at the same university, University of Delaware in the United States. Um, so today, um, Dr. Paldor is going to um, talk about dynamics of offshore freshened, sorry, dynamic of offshore freshened groundwater reservoirs. So the podium is yours and thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much for having me. <clears throat> it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to talk in front of the wonderful people of uh, the Charney School. I have nothing but uh, great memories from the short time I spent there. So unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person, but um, this is also exciting and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, and as Nicholas mentioned, I'm an associate scientist at the University of Delaware. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on a phenomenon that's uh, increasingly observed worldwide. I'm going to introduce uh, the problem in greater detail in a second, but I'll say right off the bat that um, by offshore fresh and groundwater, or OFGs, we mean fresh and groundwater that occur underneath the sea uh, in depths or in places that you typically don't expect to find them. If you think about a uh, groundwater reservoir uh, of fresh and water sitting underneath uh, tens or hundreds of meters of seawater comb, you don't ex you, you expect it to be cleared away from there uh, quite uh, rapidly. Uh, but as, it, as said, we, we see offshore fresh and groundwater in places we don't expect to see. And I'm going to try today and uh, hone a little bit on the dynamics that facilitate the occurrence of this phenomenon. And so I'll start, as I said, by introducing the problem, giving you a little bit of background on why this is important and why we uh, are interested in these uh, reservoirs and the dynamics of them. I will then uh, shift to talk about uh, the Mediterranean system that I studied a couple of years ago. Uh, I'll talk about the Achaziv submarine canyon and how that serves as an outlet for the occurrence of OFG, offshore fresh and groundwater. And I'll then talk a little bit about faults. We know that faulting is quite abundant in uh, the Eastern Levant and in that area of Northern Israel or the Israeli-Lebanon border. So I'll talk about how faults come into play in the hydrogeology. Um, and I'll then talk about uh, a little bit about future plans that we currently have uh, an NSF proposal we're about to submit to compare <clears throat> the Mediterranean system with the Hawaiian system, which obviously is a completely different geological setting, but it's also a system of OFG. And hopefully I will have uh, enough time at the end for some uh, concluding remarks. And I will say right off the bat that I'm a hydrogeologist. I'm not a marine scientist per se. Um, and this phenomenon or the OFG phenomenon is uh, unique in its interdisciplinary uh, interests. So marine geophysicists, marine biologists, I'm going to uh, I think I'm going to touch a little bit on some of these disciplines and how they are related to the OFG, but I myself come from the hydrogeological perspective, uh, and you'll see that throughout my talk. That's where my main interest lies. Okay, so diving into it, uh, to introduce the problem. Uh, we know that offshore fresh and groundwater occur uh, over multiple scales under the ocean. So typically the deeper the aquifer, the further offshore uh, the fresh water, fresh groundwater can reach. And this conceptual diagram uh, from this 2010 paper, I don't really like it, honestly, because if you think about the physics here of the fresh and groundwater wedges, this is not physical, that the flow just gets stuck. We need to have some outlet for the flow to explain where this goes and where the onshore, offshore uh, flow of fresh groundwater uh, ends. 
But if we focus on the near shore scale, that's where things are pretty simple and pretty well understood. Uh, and already in 1959, more than 60 years ago, um, Cooper drew this conceptual diagram, which uh, is amazingly similar to the way we draw it today, or, or at least to me, it's amazing because Cooper obviously didn't have the computational resources that we have today and the abundance of data and observations that we have today. But he, just by intuition, drew this uh, amazingly similar to the way we draw it today. And so what happens in the near shore scale or in phreatic aquifers is that you have elevated water tables with uh, recharge on land or rain infiltration on land that pushes fresh groundwater flow toward the sea. And the coast or the near shore environment is that outlet I mentioned for um, this fresh water to seep or to discharge out. And this facilitates uh, offshore the occurrence of offshore fresh and groundwater on the scale of meters. We typically don't see, we, we even call this sometimes coastal groundwater discharge, but it's on very small scales uh, in terms of the distance offshore that this mechanism brings fresh and groundwater. On the shelf scale, uh, there have been a couple of attempts, modeling attempts, obviously on the shelf scale and in deeper parts, we rely heavily on modeling because there's no, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, wells or observations, uh, direct observations offshore. Uh, and this 2005 paper by Alicia Wilson attempted to explain different uh, groundwater uh, circulations on the shelf scale. So this is a couple of hundreds uh, kilometers offshore. And what she showed is that uh, groundwater discharge in deeper parts of the shelf are given by uh, temperature gradients or thermal gradients, and this is geothermal convection. But if you look at the salinity in the lowest panel here, all fresh water, all salinity gradients are limited again to the coastline. So this is so this tells you that we typically don't expect to find fresh and groundwater for these normal, uh, so to speak, normal settings uh, of distances greater than a couple of meters or a couple of tens of meters offshore. However, as I mentioned in, in the opening slide, we see offshore fresh and groundwater in remote areas offshore uh, <clears throat> quite often or more and more around the world. And by remote areas, I mean water depths of greater than on the order of hundreds of meters, uh, distances offshore of greater than five kilometers. And we see these uh, all around the world today. This was published in 2013. In the nine years that have passed since, I, I can tell you that there are um, several other points that we have to put here, including our Mediterranean Sea which I'll show you in a second. But these are observed either through direct observations of uh, fresh and groundwater or indirect um, either of salinity measurements or chemical inputs that inputs that uh, suggest input of meteoric water. And back then when this paper was published nine years ago, the widely held explanation for OFGs was this explanation here in this conceptual diagram. Uh, so what they, postulated is that it's all related to um, entrapment of fresh water underneath the surface during uh, ancient lower sea level stands, during glacial periods. So you have this terrestrial system that brings fresh groundwater uh, to this area. And then when the sea level rises during the interglacial, this fresh and groundwater is trapped. And what this means is that it's not in equilibrium with the current sea level, or this is something that will, if it will be, uh, if enough time will pass, it will uh, be washed away or gradually percolate away. But we call this a passive system, passive OFG. Passive meaning that there's no current active flow sustaining these fresh and groundwater. And conversely, active systems as conceptualized here are systems that represent direct flow from the recharge area on land to the offshore area uh, where we see these fresh and groundwater. And as I mentioned, we need this outlet to facilitate the direct flow. If, there, if this confining layer, if this aquitard would have blocked the aquifer all the way, then the, the signal, the hydrogeologic signal would, would have propagated back and you, ha you had this thing stuck and perhaps percolating upward through it, not reaching all the way to this outlet. 
And the difference between active and passive systems, as I mentioned, passive systems are uh, trapped fresh in groundwater. And the important thing or the major thing to notice between uh, to differentiate active and passive systems is that uh, active systems are constantly replenished, right? We have recharge on land, uh, constantly pushing more and more fresh and groundwater to the offshore environment, whereas passive systems are finite. We have this volume kind of like an oil reservoir. And thinking about this, you, you can see that if we, uh, as hydrogeologists, want to think about these reservoirs as something as an extractable resource, then the differences between these two types of systems are very important to understand because pumping uh, a passive or an entrapped system will create a shrinking of this reservoir, again, similar to an oil reservoir trapped underneath a uh, geological structure, whereas active systems are, at least in theory, uh, infinite, right? It, it, it obviously depends, the rates of extraction obviously depend on the rates of recharge, but essentially there's nothing that limits um, the flow of this uh, constant replenishment. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on the active types. As I said, passive systems were uh, considered until recently the, pl the only plausible explanation for the observe observations of offshore fresh and groundwater. But in recent years, we've been get gathering more and more evidence for active systems. And what I'm going to show you in the next uh, 30 minutes or so uh, is how this, is, this occurs in the Mediterranean and also in Hawaii, and, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the comparisons, but again, just to mention that these are all active systems representing current or modern hydraulic connection between the onshore recharge area and the offshore fresh and groundwater reservoir, facilitated, obviously, uh, or um, mostly facilitated by discharge offshore, by groundwater discharge offshore. Okay, so switching gears here to uh, the actual science or the actual scientific part, the Mediterranean system and the Khaziv submarine canyon. Uh, I'm assuming the area is uh, well known to the majority, at least the majority of the people in the crowd, but just to, uh, just in case, this is uh, the coastline of the Israel and northern Israel. This is the Western Galilee mountainous area and the offshore Eastern Mediterranean here. This is the Akhziv submarine canyon carving into the shelf, leaving something like two kilometers width uh, of shelf in this area. And when we started off um, a couple of years ago uh, studying this system, we had a couple of indirect observations uh, from the Akhziv canyon that suggested or hinted toward uh, groundwater discharge in the canyon. So first of all, Mia El Asar found increased dolphin activity, and that um, increased biological activity is often associated with groundwater discharge because groundwater delivers nutrients that sustain uh, ecosystems or that provide sort of hot spots uh, for ecosystem functioning, and that's also true for the marine environment. Uh, so the increased dolphin activity observed by Mia El Asar su um, suggested or told us that we might. Uh, be seeing uh, seepage in the Akhziv Canyon. And also Maxim Rubin Blumenthal uh, found oxidizing bacteria on the seafloor, again, suggesting del um, delivery of nutrients through seeps. Um, and with that, we started thinking about the onshore offshore um, hydrologic system or hydrogeologic system. And the first thing to do was to uh, better understand the geological structure. So we wanted to construct this a, a prime uh, cross section going all the way from the mountainous area to the deep basin through uh, the Khaziv Canyon. And to do that, we had several sources of information, including uh, multiple water wells on land, uh, the geological map drawn by Sne in 2004. <clears throat> and I'll just say on this geological map that the green parts here are the interesting uh, layer. That's the Judea Group Aquifer. More generally, it's uh, carbonate uh, rock layers from uh, the Cretaceous, the Jurassic Cretaceous. And I'm saying this because I'll 
touch a little bit about uh, Lebanon in, in a couple of slides. So we call it in Israel, the Judea group aquifer, and that's the name I'm gonna stick to, but it's generally uh, referred to as the Cretaceous carbonate layers. That's the green uh, areas here. And their exposure on land represent the recharge area. That's where the rain falls and infiltrates into this uh, confined aquifer. And you can see it's confined further uh, to the, uh, toward the sea, because this these are younger sediments that cover uh, or that um, the, the Judea group is buried underneath. We also had the geological, uh, the structural map for the Judea group uh, that was constructed by Uri Kafri and Fleischer from uh, 2003. And lastly, the offshore portion of the section that I'm gonna show in a second was constructed with uh, seismic lines through these um, transects that you see here, these different surveys. And one thing that I will note is that, first of all, there's no, unfortunately, there was no uh, one seismic line that crossed or went along the canyon. So the data within the canyon itself was sort of interpolation and, and projection from uh, the canyon bathymetry on these sections uh, on its flanks. And also there's a gap between uh, the edge of the seismic lines and the coastline. So we had to, I think, um, seismic interpreters call it jump correlation. We had to, again, some sort of guess between the onshore and the offshore portion uh, on these two kilometers. Again, all of this is to uh, constrain the structure of the Judea group aquifer. And with all these sources of information, uh, the geological cross section that we built looks like this. And this is a simplified version of it. I only use the dual model. Uh, the Judea group is in pink here. and Everything above the Judea group was colored in the same color. We call it post-Judea. But if you're a Mediterranean geologist, a marine geologist that studies the Mediterranean, this is going to annoy you because there is a lot going on and a lot to differentiate between the post-Judea groups, the Sakia, the Mount Scopus. Some of these are actually aquifers and are not aquitards as drawn here. But for the generalized onshore offshore structure, what we were interested in is the Judea group and all the above layers were considered uh, not hydraulically conductive or not uh, facilitating groundwater flow. And that's a reasonable assumption because the Mount Scopus group as well as the Sakia group, those are all uh, layers with very low hydraulic conductivity or groundwater flows within these layers uh, very slowly, almost negligible flows. And so these yellow layers here are considered a barrier, a hydraulic barrier or uh, an overlying uh, aquitard. And the important thing to notice in this geological cross section, as I mentioned, this is the recharge area on the Western Galilee. But what we found through this uh, subsurface analysis is that the submarine canyon, the Achziv submarine canyon exposes or outcrops the Judea group aquifer to the Mediterranean at the hinge of this anticline. So we see this uh, flexural structure, which is pretty commonly um, drawn for the Cretaceous layers in the Eastern Mediterranean. But at the Achziv Canyon, there's an outcrop of the Judea group. And this is an important, a key feature of the geological cross section because this provides a, provides a potential uh, site for uh, groundwater discharge. DSGD stands for deep submarine groundwater discharge. So we're talking about depths of a uh, couple hundreds of meters, something like um, somewhere between five and 10 kilometers offshore. And with this geological cross section, what we as hydrogeologists always uh, start with is a, is a groundwater model. And so this is a fee flow. Fee flow is finite element flow and transport numerical model. It simulates groundwater flow and solute transport. In this case, the solute is salt, of course, because that's what is dissolved in seawater and that's what we're interested in. Uh, and the model was constructed based on, it, it is sort of a simplified version of that geological structure. So that flexural, synclinal, anticlinal structure, recharge area on land, and the canyon uh, bites out chunks of the overlying aquitard and exposes the aquifer in the in shaded area here, uh, exposes it to the seawater, uh, to the Mediterranean. And I will say, uh, I, I don't know how deep, I should go into the details of the boundary conditions. I, I'm assuming that's not of interest, but I, what I will say is that wherever we had data, we used actual data, for example, through these water wells that I showed on land, 
Um, and when, wherever we didn't have data, we took textbook values and ran some sensitivity analysis to make sure we cover all the ranges of uh, possible values for the different model parameters. And these are all very well constrained, uh, either well constrained values or widely held parameters. So there's no um, astonishing assumptions on this um, on this model. This is all pretty common and basic assumptions. This is uh, this is work that was published in uh, the Journal of Hydrology. And when we run this numerical model, this is the picture we get. So what we're looking at here is the salinity. Purple is uh, zero salt, meaning fresh water. Red is 100% or seawater salinity. For the Mediterranean, that's something like 39 uh, grams per liter. And you see that when we run this model, again, based on this geological structure of the onshore, offshore, Achziv, Western Galilee and Achziv Canyon, we get fresh and groundwater kilometers, uh, several kilometers offshore. That's the purple and, and uh, cooler colors here. And when we focus on this point here, the outcrop of the aquifer in the canyon, we see seepage of brackish um, groundwater. So this is DSGD or deep submarine groundwater discharge. And if, uh, again, you look at the colors we're looking at because of the mixing in the aquifer, these are not fresh groundwater per se, but they're fresh and or relatively low salinity. And so, um, Nicholas, feel free to just ping me if there's anything I should stop because I, so I see some notifications. I just, if, if there's anything that requires me to stop, just let me know. Um, and so with this modeled DSGD in mind, and again, this is underneath the sea, what we wanted to do as good modelers is to sort of ground truth the model and see if we can track these uh, DSGD or these seeps in the Achziv Canyon. Uh, so this uh, younger and prettier version of me uh, on board the Mediterranean Explorer, uh, we went to uh, see if we can track through CTD measurements and water sampling those uh, simulated um, discharge or this simulated seeps. And what we did was uh, two research cruises in winter 2016 and summer 2017 along the Achziv uh, Canyon. So each point you see here, either green from the summer 2017 cruise or blue from the winter cruise, is a point where we stopped the ship, lowered the CTD, measured a vertical salinity profile of the water column. And um, the red curly brackets here mark the area where the model predicted uh, seepage of fresh and groundwater or relatively low salinity uh, groundwater. And just for general reference, this is how the salinity profiles look like for both cruises. So these are all the profiles, all the points I showed in the previous slide plotted together for salinity, quite typically the mixing zone. I'm, I'm sure there are marine scientists here that know this way better or oceanographers that know this way better than me, but the mixing zone, uh, the mixing layer deepens uh, in the winter. And what we were interested in is the deeper parts of these profiles where you see there, there's very um, minor variability between the profiles. And what we did to sort of extract the signal was to calculate the salinity anomaly or the differences in salinity within these profiles from the deepest uh, cast measured to see if we can track anomalies of lower salinity. And that's what we're, what I'm going to show in the next slide. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm guessing uh, this can be a bit overwhelming, so I'll try to walk uh, slowly through this. What you're seeing here, the brown line is the seafloor or the bathymetry along the canyon, along the transect of measurements through the cruises. So this represents the Achziv Canyon. Below it, I plotted the geology. Again, the pink is the Judea group, the yellow is the aquitard, just for reference. And the colors here, this is all the water column, and uh, the colors red to purple represent values of salinity anomaly. And as I said, it's calculated based on the differences between each cast and the deepest cast we had. Uh, and so these values are um, accentuated, their salinity anomalies. And what you see here is this purple uh, plume, purple, light blue, and green plume of low salinity anomaly coinciding with the outcrop of the Judea group in the canyon, suggesting that indeed we see seepage of very, um, of groundwater with salinities 
very close to seawater, but still lower than seawater as the model predicts. Uh, and again, each of these is the point of, is one point of measurement along the canyon. This was for uh, the winter 2016 cruise. In the 2017, uh, we also sampled water for uh, chemical analysis. So that's something I'm also showing here. And again, this is a similar plot, the outcrop of the Judea group uh, with the aquitard uh, overlying it. And um, again, the colors are salinity anomalies. But here I also plotted the uh, radium 224 activity. Um, the, the, each point is a sample we collected for uh, the chemical analysis. And the size of the circles, I'm going to clean the values of the salinity anomalies, these numbers here, just to better uh, visualize this. And so each circle here, each point is a sample of uh, water we took and measured the radium-224 activity. Radium-224 is an isotope that is uh, characteristic of interactions with the rock. So it's enriched in groundwater. And so it's a great proxy for discharge or uh, recently discharged water uh, from interactions with the rock. And what we see when we look at these three profiles is uh, that above the aquitard, we have a high activity close to the seafloor that rapidly decays upwards. This is very characteristic of a diffusive sing signal. So close to the, sea, uh, to the seabed where there's, there, uh, there's interactions with the sediment, there's a higher activity of radium-224, but it decays rapidly going upwards. Conversely, above the, aqu the aquifer or the outcrop of the Judea group, we see higher activities going upward. And not only that, uh, the higher activities or the larger circles coincide with the areas of the low salinities or, or the plumes of the low salinity. And this is quite interesting to see that there's evidence that indeed the plumes of lower salinity or the low salinity anomalies that we see uh, are indeed, indeed represent discharge or recently discharged groundwater through this uh, increased radium uh, 224 activity. And so to conclude this part of uh, sort of intermediate conclusions, uh, I showed you that the Akhziv Submarine Canyon provides an outlet for uh, the onshore offshore flow through the Judea group. And the model predicted uh, OFG several kilometers uh, offshore. This was facilitated again by the outcrop through the Yachziv Canyon, providing uh, an outlet for discharge and, and for the direct flow from the recharge area uh, on the Western Galilee. And the associated seepage that we modeled uh, was indeed observed in depths of about uh, 400 meters and five kilometers offshore. This was observed through direct measurements of salinity and also through the radium-224 activity, which is what I showed in the previous slide. Okay, so this covered uh, more or less this five or six years of my PhD um, and in a nutshell, but now what we're looking at with uh, Claudia Bertoni from Oxford University is the role of faults. We know that there are lots of, uh, there are, um, there's fault, ex extensive faulting in the area. And Claudia is a structural ge geologist uh, working a lot on the Mediterranean or the Le Levant Basin. She has access to uh, a lot of data from areas that we didn't have. And she and her student mapped some of these faults and uh, focusing on the Cretaceous layers. Uh, again, uh, in Lebanon, they're not called Judea group. Uh, they were able to, to map some faults there that carve into or uh, cut into those layers. And so what you see here is part of their analysis. Claudia and her student conducted this, I think with the trail. And um, the yellow is the outcrops of the Cretaceous layers on land, both in Lebanon and in Israel. And they found that hydrogeologically or, or not even hydrogeological, geologically speaking, there are three modes of these Cretaceous layers onshore, offshore structures. There's a standard mode, which we all know from central Israel. Uh, somewhere around here, there's a transition to uh, a group called Talmei Yafe. There's the canyon mode that uh, the aquifer or the Cretaceous layer is exposed offshore through um, carving out of the canyon. But further to the north, they found uh, that a fault cuts 
into these Cretaceous layers, and that was interesting to study hydrogeologically or from the hydrological, the, uh, the groundwater perspective. Uh, and that's what we uh, started doing in, uh, in the recent months. This is the model uh, for that northern part, for the Lebanese part. And this is the mapped fault that they had cutting into the aquifer, going all the way up to uh, close to the surface or to the surface. Uh, it's something like 15 kilometers over four and a half kilometers. And again, this is the aquitard, in this case, away from the canyon, not exposed offshore, but it, it is cut uh, with, these, uh, with this fault. And this was the baseline simulation we ran, but we also, to test the role of faults, we also tested hypothesized faults, um, including these two. So a fault that intersects with the surface at the same place, but is a vertical fault. So we're representing a, str a straight slip regime, which we know is abundant in Northern Israel and the Western Galilee uh, and Lebanon too. And also we modeled a deeper fault because um, this, was the shallowest fault observed. So we focused on that, but in other places, it's very possible that uh, deeper faults are uh, what represent the uh, connection between the aquifer and the uh, sea. So the blue here is the sea level. This is all the offshore portion of uh, the geological structure. And again, this was uh, simulated with free flow. And this is what we get. These are uh, the observed, uh, the modeled salinities with the baseline fault, which is the actual map fault. And what you see is that the transition zone between the fresh groundwater, the purple, and the saline groundwater, the red, develops around uh, the simulated fault. And so um, with that, we can, uh, th this was an interesting observation or an interesting simulation telling us that the fault controls the extent of salinity. And as I said, we modeled also a vertical fault. And you see that simulating a vertical fault that cuts the surface in the same place, changes the salinity structure. We see more purple penetrating further offshore and these brackish groundwater reaching deeper in the basin than in this case. And the deeper fault is completely different. It pulls fresh water even further. And so again, thinking about the onshore offshore flows, this is sort of like a canyon that provides the outlet for um, discharge of groundwater, facilitating this onshore, offshore, or active OFG system. So the faults are very important to consider. That's a conclusion from uh, all this. And this is a paper we're uh, now writing. Um, and it's, it's an interesting and an important result because faults from the hydrogeological modeling standpoint are kind of messy to simulate. We usually tend to ignore faults or to somehow uh, parameterize them as some sort of uh, heterogeneity, but this tells us that this uh, this continuity, or this um, discrete element, is important, very important to consider if we want to get a good understanding of the extent and the dynamics of OFGs. Uh, so, concluding this part, uh, what I showed you is that similar to the canyon carving out the aquifer, uh, a connection between the aquifer and the seawater through faulting is also important to consider uh, for the overall functioning of the OFG, as it also provides an outlet uh, for discharge and the onshore offshore flow. Okay, so going back to the outline, uh, this more or less covered the second part on the Mediterranean system. And with the 10, a little bit more time minutes I have left, I want to show you uh, some of the uh, things we are now proposing to study in an NSF proposal that we uh, are planning to submit within the next couple of weeks, thinking about uh, the Mediterranean system in comparison with a Hawaiian system. And so we're talking about uh, quite literally the two opposite sides of the world. The Mediterranean system, I just talked about in uh, great detail now. We did hydrographic surveying. These are the papers that I showed you now. Uh, it's carbonate, as I mentioned, in, in case you forgot, it's a carbonate, well-structured um, system or geological system. And in Hawaii, uh, Eric Katias discovered offshore fresh and groundwater off the island of Hawaii. And this is a completely different uh, uh, geological setting. Hawaii is obviously a volcanic setting, nothing, not a carbonate uh, platform. So it it, it's uh, randomly distributed lava flows that... Um, um, 
serve as subsurface conduits for groundwater flow. And that's what facilitates the occurrence of offshore fresh and groundwater or the land to see hydro hydraulic connectivity through these ancient lava flows. And this is Eric Atias' work from uh, the island of Hawaii. So these are geophysical transects. That's how they discovered the OFGs there. And this is electrical resistivity. Uh, just uh, to be clear, higher values of resistivity are lower salinity, right? Fresh water is less, uh, is more resistive. So the blue here uh, are higher resistivities but represent fresh and groundwater. And these plumes are what they interpret interpreted as uh, OFGs, offshore fresh and groundwater uh, in front of the island of Hawaii. And conceptually, what I started talking about is the differences in these in the functioning of these two systems. And what we are thinking of in this proposal is expanding to the lateral dimension, to the along shore axis. So when we model things in two dimensions, which is what I showed you uh, up until now, we always think about the onshore offshore dimension or the uh, cross shore axis, which is the important thing when we think about active OFG systems, we want to understand if and how the recharge area on land is connected to the OFG reservoir offshore. But what 2D models neglect is the flow that is uh, parallel to the coastline. And when we expand our perspectives or the scope into this third dimension, then different systems such as the Mediterranean system and the Hawaiian system likely have completely different hydrologic functioning. And so thinking about the Mediterranean system conceptually, these are all map views. Uh, and so if you think of a canyon carving out, a, a submarine canyon like the Akhziv Canyon, carving out a narrow area of the aquitard, this is sort of like a funnel in the subsurface that induces lateral flow focusing, right? The flow will focus to the discharge area uh, in the Akhziv Canyon. Conversely, a randomly distributed system or a braided system of lava flows that is sort of random will have uh, lateral flow focusing on a much smaller scale or much less significant. And this is important to consider in the overall hydrologic functioning, uh, thinking about this third dimension and the lateral uh, flow connectivity, which is not something we've been thinking of as hydrogeologists until now. We've all, always been focusing on the onshore offshore dimension, but this is interesting to think about uh, if we want to further develop these OFGs as resources. And for this volcanic-like system, a 3D model has recently been published. Uh, this is a 2021 paper by my postdoc advisor, Holly Michael, and uh, a previous postdoc of hers, Leo Gang. And they studied, uh, they modeled these onshore, offshore sections, including um, lateral flows or flow along uh, the coastline, parallel to the coastline. They study, they simulated different uh, random heterogeneities that um, facilitate different uh, various magnitudes of lateral flows. So these are the gray streamlines that you see here going uh, along the coastline. And you see that in some cases it was extensive and uh, significant lateral flows. And in other heterogeneous cases, they were uh, negligible or less um, lower in magnitude. And these turned out to be significant in the overall um, volume of the mixing zone, which is a proxy for uh, the overall fresh and groundwater stored offshore. And this gives us uh, an interesting starting point to think about these different, different systems that facilitate different magnitudes of lateral flows in terms of the overall or the volume, the three-dimensional volume of OFG uh, reservoirs. That was... Uh, uh, Leo and Holly's paper for a volcanic system, but there's a lot to explore there. And what we want is we want to do is to uh, do this or a similar thing for the Mediterranean system. So I mentioned that uh, everything I showed you until now was based on this two-dimensional analysis, the geological cross-section. But we know that in 3D, there's also an important dynamics of narrowing of narrow apertures along the canyon that likely induce this lateral flow focusing. And so for this system, these are very preliminary results we included in the proposal, uh, but we simulated these two 
generalized or simplified versions of uh, the canyon system or the carbonate system in the Mediterranean. And so on the left here, you see a representation, a simplified representation of this 2D system. So this is the entire model domain with an aqua aquifer in yellow confined by an aqua overlying aquitard. And it, it outcrops along this canyon offshore. This is, uh, again, a generalized or simplified version of what I've showed you previously with the fee flow model. But what we did uh, to include in the proposal is to simulate a three-dimensional system with this canyon-like exposure. So on the lateral sides of the canyon, the aquifer is not exposed to the sea, only uh, in the canyon. And we ran this to, to uh, better to compare uh, and, and to understand the importance of lateral flow focusing or the lateral dimension, the along shore dimension. So here we include uh, lateral flow and here we don't have. This is assuming that no flow is uh, occurring uh, along the coastline or parallel to the coastline. And this is uh, the preliminary results. So the salinity structure here between purple and yellow. Yellow is salt water, purple is fresh water. This is uh, the upper panel is a slice through the three-dimensional um, model and the lower panel is the 2D model entirely. That's the entire model domain. It's only a slice because it's a 2D cross-sectional model. And uh, this is from the uh, exact same place. So this goes along the same transect of the 2D model, but we see differences in the salinity structure when we have flow focusing or when we think about the three, third dimension of uh, the alongshore compared to when we don't. And to better visualize this, I calculated the difference between these two. So this panel now is uh, um, the upper 3D minus the lower the 2D. And what you see here is uh, the colors are now salinity differences. And the entire offshore domain shows us significant differences of up to 10%, either negative or positive, meaning that uh, more salt is stored in the 3D or less salt is stored when we uh, simulate this in 3D. And the bottom line from all this is that for the Mediterranean lake system or the carbonate lake system, it's important to consider these um, lateral flows or the third dimension um, where, where we see, even for this, very simplified and sort of back of the envelope modeling, we see large discrepancies or large differences uh, in the salinity. And so this provides us uh, an interesting uh, future perspective to study both in terms of the Mediterranean system itself or Mediterranean-like systems, and also in comparison with the volcanic system where lateral flow focusing is expected to be much less significant. And so uh, just to add this to the list and the conclusions, um, I showed you that in volcanic settings such as Hawaii, uh, the onshore offshore hydraulic connectivity is facilitated with randomly distributed uh, ancient lava flows, these um, channelized conduits. And this was uh, simulated by Gang and Michael. Uh, it's still very uh, preliminary. So there's, there's a lot to explore there. Uh, specifically for Hawaii, but generally for uh, these types of systems. And uh, comparing these, conceptually uh, comparing these two types of systems, the Mediterranean funnel-like system and uh, volcanic system, we expect to see uh, significant differences in the hydrologic functioning of these two. And I, I just want to emphasize again that both systems, the Hawaiian and the Mediterranean, are active OFGs. They have onshore, offshore, direct hydraulic connectivity. Flow uh, is facilitated all the way from recharge areas onshore to discharge areas offshore, or at least stored uh, fresh in groundwater offshore. But the importance of these different active systems in, in terms of the uh, lateral flow connectivity are interesting to further explore. And that's what we propose to do uh, with the NSF proposal, thinking about future developments of these uh, reservoirs as uh, potential resources. And so with that, uh, with a couple of minutes to spare, I, I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators. Um, the Mediterranean uh, model I showed uh, initially was uh, constructed in my PhD. So I, I want to thank Inata Ronov and Oded Katz, uh, who are my PhD advisors. And Holly Michael is my postdoc advisor here. Uh, I mentioned Claudia Bertoni and her student, Benjamin Penny. They did the northern or they expanded the Levant model uh, further to the north. Uh, 
So, so thanks to all my uh, collaborators and also thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anel. Very interesting results, very exciting also about the potential of the work for also using that water actually. Um, in many aspects, we can use it. So I, I, I open the podium for um, the audience to, um, to ask questions, okay? So I don't see everybody. Whoever wants to ask a question, just step in and, and ask it. No questions so far. Don't be shy. Wait until people think on a question. I will ask. Ah, it's thick. It's thick. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so, a uh, great talk. Very interesting stuff. You know that I've been liking this for a, lo for a long time. Thanks. Um, and I'm really thrilled about the, the concept. Um, there are some, some questions I have. One is in your model, when the fresh water come out, they, they either go up and sort of accumulate at a layer beneath the surface. You see like a blob beneath the surface in your in your measurements. Uh, measurements, not model. Okay, yeah, not yeah. the model, the measurements, right. There is the blob this beneath one. the surface and there is, in this one less, in the summer one, you actually see the water going down. Here too, it's not going up, it's going down the slope uh, in this in, in the sorry in the this is the summer right the winter ones yeah you're talking about this one this they're, they're actually going down slope why would fresh water go down slope this way yeah that's a great question um and why so would they we... accumulate in a layer also okay so why would they accumulate in the layer you're talking about the upper plume this upper plume okay so the Explanation that Boaz Lazar, who I forgot to mention as uh, um, the person who uh, helped me with this, he thought that this may be, uh, so the upper plumes or the separation between plumes that is also observed here may be related to episodes of discharge. He called it burps of discharge from, of groundwater that somehow seized at some point and then re uh, reoccurred. And it's not very hard to think of mechan oceanographic mechanisms that would, if, if you have higher sea level or tides that sort of clog this flow and then you have a release of the burden. So you have these episodes of different discharges, which if after the fresh water starts to expand uh, or this plume starts to expand within the water column, then you'll get this structure of expanded plumes that were, uh, that represent um, different episodic uh, seepage, episodic discharge events. And as for this lower slope, I'll say two things. First of all, if you, if you look at these values, I'm not, there's a great deal of uncertainty here. I think the signal here is very significant or very, is significant compared to the error. The calibrated error was 10 units of anomaly and this is minus 39. So it's four times higher signal, but it could be that this is, the specific structure of the plume, there's a great uncertainty on it. I, I I can't swear that this is exactly how the plume works. If I am to suggest an explanation for this structure, then I would say there are likely temperature differences between this fresh this uh, discharge water and the water column. And temperature differences may mean that the, the density differences play differently than what we expect between fresh water. So essentially you're right. If, if it's only salinity, then fresh water, we would expect it to go directly up with a buoyancy force. But if you think about temperature differences, this may be uh, cooler water that is heavier overall, even though it's uh, lower salinity. And so it sort of slides down with the slope. But again, I'm not- the, Do you have yeah. the temperatures from the wells? There are no temperature wells. Of the wells. The, we don't have wells here. No, I we mean the loved... onshore, the onshore wells. Oh, do you um, have temperatures there? So some of these are. Uh, so the water wells I ha I got from the Water Authority, and the data there is not very well organized. 
uh, I think they had uh, water temperatures only for some of the wells and mostly the shallow ones, which is unfortunate because the deeper ones are the more interesting ones. Um, so yeah, but but I agree. This is something that we we need to think of, and and I, I'm not sure why this looks like that. Did, did you plot the thermal anomalies together with the salinity anomalies? You made the measurements of temperature. I did. Uh, I have them. I don't have them on my um here, but um, Boaz Lazar said when he looked at the temperatures that he doesn't believe uh, the temperatures are significant to plot. And so we excluded mm -hmm. them from the paper. And honestly, once I published the paper and moved on to my postdoc, <laughs> I have the data yeah. and I'm happy to send it to anyone who's interested. I, it, that's easy, but I haven't looked at it deeply. Maybe one more question before I let others uh, ask. Uh, the faults, how did you parameterize? What is a fault uh, in terms oh, of your model? That is a fantastic question. And as I mentioned, the importance of this is because hydrogeologists really hate to work with faults. Faults are these discrete elements, this discontinuity, which we don't like in the models. They always destabilize the models. And numerically speaking, they're virtually impossible to, mo to model. The way I did this is I had a very high refinement. I didn't plot here the numerical el the elements that we simulated, but I had a very uh, increased, a very refined grid here. And I associated this with um, sort of, so when the fault occurs, there's uh, um, gouge, I think they call it, which is more conductive or compared to the aquitard, it's more hydraulic, hydraulically conductive uh, than the aquitard. But the thing to notice here is that there's a directionality to this uh, conductivity, right? There's a high anisotropy. So that, that's the way I model this as a discrete element with, sorry, not as a discrete element, as a zone, a, a very narrow zone of higher hydraulic conductivity, but only along the fault, right? It, the fluids migrate easily along fault, not necessarily across the fault. So I had uh, higher hydraulic conductivity than the aquitard, but with an isotropy that matched the direction of the fault. That's how we simulated it. Okay, that explains the results. Right. It just empties the it just empties the water, which is, you know, hydraulically speaking, I think that's reasonable. That's well, what not necessarily means. because we when we look at the gas seepage, for example, in the offshore, not necessarily does seepage follow the fault. Really? In many places, we see that seepage do not follow the fault, but actually goes vertically up. So it's not clear that offshore faults in the sediments we have in the offshore are actually a are actually conductive. But uh, this is something interesting to look into, definitely. Yeah, I agree. I will say that in California, I don't know if you know the work from Monterey Bay, they, they modeled and, and measured um, vents, they call it vents of flow, of fluids on, in Monterey Bay offshore uh, California. And they simulated the faults similarly as, as flow conduits. Uh, or or hydraulically bearing um, layers. So we followed, uh, I think Claudia contacted a person there, I can't remember his name, but they they advised us on how to model faults without going into, you know, discrete elements, which grew up the entire models. Uh, but yeah, I agree. It's, it's something interesting to think of other fault representations. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question in the chat, which I will move through. Um, Martha is uh, asking, uh, she's curious about measuring salinity in the aquitard. Can it salinity be done? Salinity in the aquitard? Yeah. So, okay. So this is not, we did not measure the salinity in the aquitard. The, this, the subsurface salinities I showed here, all of these diagrams are all modeled. They're, these are not observations. The observations are limited to the water column itself, not in the subsurface. 
So the aquitard salinities are not measured. That, that would have been interesting and important to study. Uh, what I will say is that we're now, or, or maybe that's what you're asking. So I'm sorry if I misunderstood the question. With the NSF proposal we have now, we're suggesting to do a similar thing uh, to what Eric did in Hawaii. And these are through geophysical measurements and the electrical resistivity, I missed it, yeah, this. So what, what this does is you travel with a ship on the surface and there's uh, there there's a lot of geophysical measurements, but this specific one, I think they call it uh, CSCM. And it's, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong, controlled source electromagnetics. And they have a source of energy in the receiver, and they measure electrical resistivity of the subsurface. And that's limited to certain depths, depending on the instrumentation you have and the salinity gradients. But generally speaking, it's an indirect observation. You don't have wells that you drill into and actually touch, so to speak, the water. You just measure them through geophysical measurements, in this case, electromagnetics. That answers your question. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask myself, um, how do you think the um, water, the discharging water and the different salinities may influence this, the biology and the, uh, the benthic biology? Yeah, so that's Maybe a great question. That. I don't know. No, no, that's, that's an important question because as I mentioned, there are a lot of stakeholders in these in this phenomenon. Whether or not we have discharge is important for uh, biogeochemists, marine biologists. And also one thing I didn't mention, and that's probably um, interesting to think about is uh, seafloor morphology because seepage forces have the, uh, the potential to alter the seafloor sediment transport and, and destabilization. For the biological aspect, I will say that the interactions of the water with the rock enrich them with nutrients. I showed this, uh, I showed an enrichment in radium, but there are other nutrients that are enriched when uh, groundwater seeps through the sediment. And this is known to provide, I, I think it's known, this is uh, uh, not my field, but um, from my conversations with marine biologists, wherever you have seepage, there's greater uh, ecosystem functioning or, or more or richer ecosystems that rely on these seeps uh, that supply nutrients. Okay. And, and just, just to follow up on that, when we think as hydrogeologists, when we think of further developing these reservoirs as resources, for example, pumping them, one of the things that we want to simulate with the proposed work is how pumping these reservoirs will reduce will reduce discharge and will this have an effect on the ecosystems on the biology on the marine biology and so that's it, it's an important thing to consider as sort of a collateral environmental impact of the hydrogeology which we as hydrogeologists tend to focus only on the dynamics of flow and transport but it's definitely important okay okay thank you very much uh i think that we have uh we have a, we are a little bit over the time, so if there are no further questions, uh, perhaps we should uh, let let you go <laughs> for your daily routine. So, right. No, Thank you very much. Question. But in any case, if somebody has a question, I'm sure that uh, Anne will be answering by email. Very happy. So, to take any questions you have for email. Feel free to get in touch. I'm really happy to chat and discuss. Thanks, Beverly. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks, Anu. Uh, Let's talk. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much, Anel. Exciting results. Have a good day over there. Thanks. Be bye bye. Too. Bye.